V from the Gutters, episode 137. Welcome to View from the Gutters, the comic book podcast where each episode we discuss a collected edition, trade paperback, or graphic novel, and then recommend and vote on the book for the next episode. Warning, the discussion portion of this show has massive spoilers for that book. On this episode we discuss Madame Xanadu, and to skip ahead to the recommendation section, skip to 12032. Uh, Alright, uh, View from the Gutters episode 137, I'm Andrew Chard. Brant Gillahan Eddy. I'm Tobias Panchin. I'm Kaylee Fleeman. And I'm Kid Rhodes. And I'm very confused because we have totally rearranged the studio while yeah. I've been gone. Yeah. <laughs> and now everything is different. Yeah. I came in last week and I was like, I'm in the wrong room. <laughs> yeah. I guess. I don't know. I wanted to move everything around. It makes more sense in my head it's now. It looks really good. No, and yeah. It's a, a lot nicer. Big TV with action figures in front of it. Those are me, both. Hey, new Patreon level for $100. We'll send you pictures of the studio so you can see what we're talking about. No, it looks great. Do that. <laughs> I will just take <laughs> the, Yeah, I'll send it. Totally uh, you don't have it. to send $100 for that. It's, I mean, you could just send us $100. Right. That's that's how that works. Right. I can no, send pictures to whoever I want. Or you can do $200 totally... and Kaylee will write fanfic about it. That's you. already on there. That's yeah. up there. You can do I that. already put that up. I know. Um, I think that's the best deal on there. <laughs> Uh, I think so too. <laughs> quick announcements. Thank yes. you as always to our Patreon episode sponsors. Uh, Brian May, Brandon Hill, um, Becca Lewandowski, Becca and, and uh, Addison Appleby. And Addison Appleby. Thank you. I got confused. You looked at me like you were really convinced. I was like, we do this every week. But you've been gone. It's been so three weeks. weeks since I did this. <laughs> uh, also, a, another birthday shout out to Brian May. Yay. Happy birthday, Brian. And... Legally, we can sing the happy birthday song to him on the air, and no one can do jack shit about it because yeah. it's not copyrighted anymore. But we're not going to. No, we could. We could. <laughs> I, I just want to that ask, to be clear. We, we could, we could definitely so, do that. I'm going to pull a Joe real quick. Oh, um, fun story about the happy birthday song. My family has like a tradition about it, and I thought that this was just kind of st- standard where you sing it in the saddest, slowest, most off key way that you can. And because singing that song is just always terrible. Um, and uh, so it, it was joy into the lives of millions. Yeah. Uh, but it was Audrey's birthday and everybody started singing to her and I started singing to her in the way that I'm used to. <laughs> and I finished about five bars after everybody else. And it was wonderful. <laughs> um, my question to everyone then is, does this mean that like Red Robin and Cold Stone employees now don't have to make up like fake birthday songs? Yeah. Happy, know. happy birthday. Happy, it's your birthday. Because I like those <laughs> fake birthday songs more than the actual Well, I think now songs. they're they've been around for so long that yeah. part of the experience. Yeah. Absolutely. But some new company that is going to take the nation by storm, they'll just sing happy birthday. Because they won't have to invest the uh, intellectual development of well, they're not going to be taking me by storm then. That's the whole reason I go to, to <laughs> fancy sit down restaurant. Fancy, I, go, yeah, go, fancy sit down like restaurant. Red Robin. And Chi Chi's Red Robin. TGI Friday. <laughs> I think the weirdest Chili's. thing is actually going to be hearing them doing it on television. That is going to be strange. You could always use, I think it was like four seconds of it or something. Yeah. So you'll hear the end of it a lot in movies. And you're like, what is, what? Oh, okay. They'll just come in it. on yeah. two years. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> What's happening here? Uh, which just means we'll have to sit through it in a lot more media and it'll be Ugh. boring as it always is. <laughs> Why did they well, ever we, pass that decision? I think the thing is <laughs> now that they idea. can make the movie adaptation of, of the song, song. Oh. like Love Potion number nine. Yeah. Everybody remembers that movie. Or the Beatles help, yeah. Uh, Yellow submarine and uh, hard day's night was that the other yeah, one? Yeah, hard day's night. There you go. Movies. I think I like the hard day's night the best. That is the black and white one. I think that one is the is best it? one. I think Maybe that I'm... one's black and white. Help is color live action. And then okay, no, then I am thinking of help because that's the one at the beginning where they're being chased. Yes, and then they go into the four doors and they all open into the same giant apartment that's four buildings long. Uh, I I remember in Help they get chased a lot, and That's Ringo has the magic ring, and the mad scientist is like, with that ring, I could, dare I say it, rule the world. 
That sounds right to me. That's a beautiful it, film. It was a ridiculous movie at the time. Um, so yeah, yeah, comic books. Mm-hmm. Yes. Let's talk about comic books. Yes. We're Specifically. talking about Madame Xanadu. That comic book. The 2008 to 2010 Vertigo series. Yes. Kaylee. Yes. You pitched Madame Xanadu. Why, yes, I Like did. 20 times. <laughs> yes, I did. You have did. been champing at the bit. Chomping? Yes. Actually, both are uh, appropriate. Nope, only chomping. No, it's I've heard both. Both, <laughs> both are acceptable. <laughs> Um, wow, I didn't realize I was going to cause that trouble. I was just asking. I actually listened to a podcast where they talked about that. I, acceptable. Oh my God. Uh, my favorite thing is when people just yell, I'm here. I totally did Kill not get a word of that. Every time. Your favorite thing is? When people yell, I've heard both. Oh. So I had to do that because it makes me laugh. <laughs> I've heard both. <laughs> Although, see, we now know what Toby does with his free time, and he listens this to podcasts about birds. That does about not surprise me. Uh, Sleep presents Lexicon Valley, an amazing show. I re- recommend that everybody go check it out. Yeah, if you need to fall so, asleep uh, immediately, yeah, check how, out. how do they pronounce Wendigo? Uh, it's Wendigo. It's the Wendigo. You guys all say it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's pronounced DVD. It's not a Wendigo. <laughs> No, it's a it's a Winnie Dago. If anyone doesn't know what we're talking about, go ahead and listen to episode I have fucking who knows. Uh where we talk about goners. Yep. A great episode. I wanna say it's a hundred and thirty two. I have no I question d- mark. I don't I I don't think it was that even, recently. I could, couldn't couldn't even uh, begin to tell you if that's correct. Some, I yeah. could look it up, but honestly, no. you could do it just as fast yeah. as I could, dear listeners. So go yeah. ahead and do that. Yeah. For the meantime, know. Madame yes. Xanadu, mm-hmm. yes. Kaylee, yes. What, uh, do you, what, do you, what do you like about yes. this book? What Why were you like so interested book? in talking about it? Well, I ask as if I didn't know. <laughs> it's Madame Xanadu, hey, and it's Kaylee, magic. Is there a magic lady in this? There's a magic oh, now, lady now in this. I know this. why you like it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, like, Wow, she's a lady and she's magic, and that's really all you need to know about the book. I'm Does done. this have like supernatural elements in it? Yeah, it like you maybe know. a demon, yeah, a fight of good against evil. Yeah, is she um, forlorn because she's in love with an angel who can never truly love her back, and she's all whoa, torn. whoa, that angel totally loves Dean back. Excuse okay, you. one, I okay. don't know what he's <laughs> anyway. really talking about. That was not in the book. Uh, alert, two, supernatural. in book no, two... I wasn't talking about Supernatural. I was talking about this book. In book two, those two are totally just gal pals. I don't know what anyone is talking yeah. about. They were... De- yeah, they were... They're obviously just best just gal, friends. Just gal, just, gal pal, <laughs> just gal pal things. Actually, really funny thing in yes. history... That was um, how lesbians were able to get away with being so openly lesbian in public because mm. men were just like, oh, I don't know, I guess that's what women do. I guess they kiss each other in public. And they're like, yeah, yeah, just gal pals. Yep. And they're like, okay, cool. Sure. Yep. And <laughs> they just, men are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> just Good story. Lasted until like the 60s or 70s, I no, think. Yesterday. Yep. I just learned about it yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, about the book. Yeah. Um. I was reading, so first off, what it's about. Um, Madame yeah, Xanadu magically. follows Madame Xanadu from her from her beginnings up until right around, I guess, like the beginning of the Justice League. Um, um, it ends right before all of the main DC superheroes start really coming out. Yeah, it ends right it's before in, Crisis on Infinite it, There's a date. Mm. It's in the 70s. 60s? Yeah, I think it's like early 70s. I don't remember. Uh, well, yeah, so, at, uh, I don't know, spoilers for the last issue, since we're jumping right ahead, the woman that she's talking to, they say that like it had been about 10 years, and yeah. that was in 1964. Or, yeah, or 64. 64. So presumably that last issue takes place in the mid-70s. Okay. okay. Um, Which would make Cohen's. sense, since all the superheroes were kind of around for about 10 years at the point that Crisis on Infinite Earths happens in 85. Why are we doing cool. windmill arms, Kaylee? Anyway, She's back to my point. A train. Um, yes, keeping this Madame Xanadu train rolling. Um, so it follows her story specifically, which I think does a lot for new readers to DC because I honestly don't know that much about DC other than the cartoons. Um, I learned a lot about the DC universe 
pre Justice League, pre all of that going on. Um, and so it, it follows her from when she was a, um, like an, what do they refer to her as? Uh, they refer to her as Eldritch, um, Elder Homo, Child, Homo Child, Magi, Eternal, okay. the yeah. Homo Magi. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, when the series begins, she's probably already several hundred years old. Right. Like, right. She's well, still very much an adolescent. We know that she is. Yeah. Not probably. We know for a fact she is hundreds of years old because of the flashback. In mm-hmm. that's true. To Roman times. Yeah. Well, um, she's okay. So that is that is a point of contention in Madame Xanadu's history of like when exactly is she Madame Xanadu, but. Uh, the flashback in volume three it goes all the way back to the dawn of man. Right. Yeah. So she's. Yeah, but when is the many, dawn of man exactly? Many wow. thousands of years old. Right. Because I mean, presumably, I mean, she's born. She was born after the fall of Atlantis, whenever that happened. Right. Um, which you know it may have been tens of, uh, ten thousand years ago, or hundreds of thousands years ago, right. in the time before time, or whatever, before the rise of man as a mm-hmm. creature. Right. Like it's really not clear. It's the mythic time. Right. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter. I've so. always wondered: was Atlantis part of Pangea? Maybe. Well, I mean, you have it's to... mythical. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's a mythical it's city. So place. sure, probably, presumably, maybe, it maybe real. a cloud city. No, I mean, well, the, it, there are different schools of thought yeah. on this. If we really wanted to go down this rabbit hole, but most of them posit that Atlantis would have been its own island okay. around at the time that Pangaea may or may not have been Pangaea, but okay, but sure, yeah. But There's a local institute anyway, that you can consult if you were interested. Um, so basically, this story arc, all four volumes, follow her development from this eldritch being that is kind of while invested in humanity, sees herself as above humanity, um, and kind of her progression into Madame Xanadu, somebody who helps others and uses her powers and her status <coughs> to to influence events around her and to provide aid to those who need her. Um, and I was surprised because I was reading some reviews kind of for discussion points before this, and I saw a lot of reviews that called her annoying and like one note because she had like this weird superior sense of morality and like they're like oh well she is just you know has no faults and it makes for a boring character and i really didn't get that impression at all bullshit like (laughs) um that's that's something that like people always love in characters is when they're boring in one note like that's something uh, people fucking idolize characters that are one note characters uh, Spike Spiegel, the worst character ever written. <laughs> Fight me. Um, Mario from Mario Brothers. Th- not the one from the movie, though. <laughs> He's different. No, but like um, Spike Spiegel is like a very much a one note character. He's like, this is the thing. It's like, oh, I'm either sad or I'm fighting. Like he th- he almost never has any attitude stuff. But that doesn't. That's not a reason to not like a character. Right. Is because they are one note. '90s animated Hulk. There are so many examples of <laughs> characters that don't change. Wait, so I'm right? Not, I'm well, not winning but this, this no, this is not. This is not, not a one note you don't character. win. Um, um, well, the thing I found interesting was that I feel like she's not. Like she starts out with this idea of I know what's best and I will mm. do what's best and I have no faults. Um, and one of the things um, is she has kind of a superiority complex. But she, that's kind of the point, at least in the first two issues. Like, she never questions her own actions, um, even when it causes damage and, like, destruction to others. She will still kind of like, well, that was the right decision. Um, she sees the future. Yes, but it also makes it so that she wants to enact her own will upon the future. Um, which is kind of why she and the stranger have so much conflict. Um, but one good example of this is when she and Marisol are living together Mm -hmm. and Marisol's basically begging her to go to church Mm -hmm. 
to dissuade suspicion from the Spanish Inquisition. Mm -hmm. And she refuses. Mm -hmm. And she's very dismissive. And she says things like, well, I I would feel wrong pretending to worship another's God, Mm -hmm. things like that. And she feels justified in this decision to not go and to be who she is openly. Mm -hmm. And it ends with Marisol being burned at the stake. And that is Xanadu's fault. Because Mm -hmm. if she had kind like if she had played along or had used her powers to hide themselves or anything like that, instead of just not listening and being so brazen, then she wouldn't have invited suspicion and there wouldn't have been a like an inquiry in the first place. I think it's less about who's at fault and more about decisions have consequences. Right. Marisol made her bed. She has to lie in it. Like she chose to live in that city with the Inquisitor. She chose to stay when Xanadu was like, We can leave whenever we want. Yeah. Why don't we go, Marisol? And she's like, No, I want to stay. This is the city I was born in. I'm gonna stay here. I'm gonna keep working for the church. Her decisions led her to her death as much as anyone else's. Right. And I think the more that story in particular, because it's it's kind of um like the framing device of that story is the three families who've been pursued through time because mm-hmm. they sold out to save themselves. It's all, it's all about how complicated choices are mm-hmm. and about how there is no clear, like, well, you said yes on that one day. And then four years later, it all led to you dying. Like it is a complicated series right. of your actions have complicated series of, um, consequences specifically because like what did the family that chose to save their family instead of the other family that they sold out to the inquisition like what did they do wrong they didn't yeah. necessarily do anything wrong they just like made the best of a bad situation and it just meant that their ancestors were hunted forever and then killed by a giant flame demon yeah that's it that's and, all. i mean like that's <laughs> that happens like they didn't really have a better choice other right. than die yeah. now or die later like that it was me all the time fire demon yeah it was just it was a, sh- a shitty situation and it's right like, you know yeah. that's that's how the world is I uh, the world of Zan- Madame Xanadu is definitely like that. Whether or not the real world is like that, I guess, is up for debate. But what I think the author is supposing is like there's not always a good solution to your problems, and sometimes yeah. they just create more problems. And yeah, I think no, that's, that's that's what Xanadu's all about. In my mind, is she she isn't like. I can see the future, therefore I can make sure that everything ends up okay. It's like, I can see the future, therefore I can protect (coughs) people who need protecting. To keep events like the family having to sell themselves, sell out the secret of another family, to prevent stuff like that from happening. Mm -hmm. That's what she's around for. Where people have no choice, and so they have to choose between one shooting decision and another shooting decision. Right, yeah, and that's definitely... I guess I hadn't thought of it that way. Like I just saw a lot of her arrogance in it and then her transformation from this sort of arrogant character who had the superiority complex to um, like her redemption of herself after she leads to the creation of the specter Um, or I guess she doesn't really lead to the creation of it, but she allows it to happen when she could have stopped it. She could have intervened Mm. in some way. Um, but she was bitter and she wanted this force that she could control and manipulate. Um, and so for me, this story arc is about the growth of this character and how she changes from this very static character, kind of similar to Morpheus um, in Sandman. Like how There's he begins- another one no character. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like how he begins kind of, he's, he's very set in his ways and there's he may or may not protect others um, just kind of dependent upon his overall nature. And by the time that he changes, he's a very different entity than what he started out as both physically and emotionally. Yeah. Um, And I feel the same about Madame Xanadu. Um, She starts out, she's very static. She's very set in her ways. She, acts in in the best interest of what she thinks is herself and everybody else around her. 
And then by the end of the story, she makes entirely different decisions and she is helping those who come to her seeking her help and influencing them in a way that is not earth shattering, but is beneficial. Well, I would buy that analysis if you were reading it only in terms of like this issue comes before that next issue, but that's not the chronology that we're given of Madame Xanadu. Like the stories in the first trade take place after a lot of betrayal has happened to her. So chronologically, she's already gone through a lot of changes by the time we meet her in the first trade. Mm -hmm. So I think that she's a constantly changing character. I do think she is kind of one note because she's like, I can fucking see the future. I know what's going to happen and I'm magic, so I'm going to keep helping people. But I think a lot of what she does comes out of the fact that her sister did what she did. And the way that Morgan betrayed her people and was exiled, I think that leads to a lot of how Madame Xanadu sees the world. Like um, watching the growth of humanity in volume three to become what it is guides her to a specific kind of future. And Mm -hmm. then in volume one, when we meet her for the first time, we like... Because the the whole book is presented out of chronological order. Right. So it's hard to take, like, say, oh, Madame Xanadu at the beginning of book one changes into this super different character at the beginning of book four. Because right. Because it's like, well, that's not exactly what happened. Yeah. yeah she, but that was sort of the overall arc that I noticed with the presentation because I feel like that also plays a part in how the author wants her to grow as a character. Like, he presented her stories in a certain order to show the influences that it has. So I do feel like the character that we begin with or like who she starts out as is different from the character at the end. Even if things happen out of chronological order or even if they sort of happen in other realms as sometimes happens with these sorts of books. Um, we do end up with a different character and the decisions that she makes at the end are different than from the decisions that she would make at the beginning. That's exactly what I was going to, that's exactly what I was just about to say is that you can ask yourself the question, would the character make a different decision at the end of the book? And I think in this case, she absolutely would. Yeah. But my argument, I guess is not that did she change? It's like, did she go from unchanging to changing? Like she was always changing. The chronology that we're presented with, like, she's always faced with new stuff and going, oh, that's why this is the way it is. Like, she's always been a changing character. Yeah, in some ways, I think, for sure. Um, She changes because she adapts, but she definitely has some, like, bitterness that she holds on to up until, like, a key event. And she will hold on to that, and that's a core Uh, a core aspect of her personality and who she is. And then with the, uh, with the creation of the specter, she lets go of a lot of her anger and a lot of her bitterness and that changes her decision. So even though she is always changing, she is now changing some core aspects is basically my point. See, I didn't get a whole lot of anger and bitterness off of her as a character to me she felt sort of naive and innocent Mm -hmm. throughout the entire book and like i i really really like amy reader's art mm -hmm. but the way that she draws xanadu is as if she was a 16 year old girl forever Mm -hmm. and i think that that affected the way that i perceived the character because i i saw her as this like like very young person who is constantly going through life with this kind of innocent, like people are good. The world is nice. Like I'm going to help people and everything will be okay. Kind of attitude and jumping from like hundreds of years and her still seeming to have a very similar attitude about the world and about people. Like we see her in Xanadu and then we see her in the the revolution in France Mm -hmm. and she's, it doesn't seem like any time has passed between those moments. She feels like exactly the same person. So hundreds of years have gone by. Yeah. So this is actually something that really stuck out to me, um, which is, I think, unfortunately, I don't want to call it laziness per se, because I think Matt Wagner is a very capable writer, but I think it's something, I think it's an easy, either it's an easy trap to fall into, or it's a very common technique, which is um, 
the closer you get to now, the more interesting time is. So the more we're going to tell you about what happened now. And now, yeah. mm-hmm. like some of that makes sense, right? I mean, life surely didn't move at the same speed. Things didn't change as dramatically. That right. said, certainly plenty of drama could have occurred. I mean, especially like being in Xanadu, like you could have done, I mean, you could have done a 29 issue run of her just being in, in the general presence of Khan. Like the, but but I feel like that's a very big trope of like immortality stuff is like is like oh well they've lived for hundreds of years but they only changed now and it's like mm-hmm. that's really weird. The one that actually sticks out to me the most egregiously in this moment is for whatever reason Angel from Joss Whedon's Buffy the Vampire Slayer. He's like he's this horrible guy for hundreds of years, but then he meets a girl and now he's a different dude. Yeah, yep. just like every guy, yep. right? Yeah. Brent, yeah. Am I right, Brent? <laughs> so, and I agree with you. I think that uh, Tobi, the I like Amy Reader's art, but I feel like um, oh, what was? Do you guys name? really think she looks sixteen? I mean, no, no, no. I, I don't I think she, like I don't personally look like she's sixteen. She looks like mid twenties to me. Yeah, but I certainly think that I, just I like see, every superhero that she I see looks eighteen to twenty. Yeah, I mean, I I still feel like she's presented more youthfully and less. More of a of a youth, less of an like a you know, more a girl, less a woman. Mm, yeah, than, there's a child. Um, who's this? Who's the other artist who did the big her. arc with like Zatara? Um, uh, G Willow, uh, not G Willow. Um, uh, um, Wilson. Um, I'm trying to remember. I don't remember, but that arc was co-written by the guy who actually created Madame Zanadu. So that was cool. Um. I'm gonna. Have uh, it was there. Michael Kaluda for who he did the original character design That's, of yeah. Madame Xanadu. I remember reading it in the back of one of them, like, "Hey, we're getting the original creator, mm-hmm. and he's going to tell us why he invented her." And then he's mm-hmm. like, "Well, I put a character in a book because I needed a character, <laughs> and then people liked her." And those are. <laughs> That's how they all start. The, yeah, those are I mean, honestly like some of my favorite character creation stories. Like there were those like, words like, oh yeah, it came, came to me in a like dream. This. It meant a lot because it reflected my grandmother and da 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 da. And then there's those are just like, I don't know, I just wrote somebody. Alan Moore. I needed a going. young girl who wore black to be in the background of this scene and then she became a character. <laughs> Alan Moore going, I want to write a guy who looks like Sting. Yep. Yeah. And now you have John Constantine. Yep. Um, I don't remember the name of that artist. Uh, it's gonna drive me crazy. It's another. It's another woman, which is it, 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 it's, it's not Joel. Joel Jones. You're not talking about Joel. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Gerald Jones. And I, I was who does some fantastic work on Lady Killer right now. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I really um, dig her style. It but, has evolved, but a anyway, lot. like yeah. so. So this was something that I felt there. Were, there were I had oh. So many things collided. <laughs> there was the issue of like time moving and her, and I agree with you, Tobias. I read her as moving through chronological time as presented as being more of a naive person. Like she, uh, like, like there's so many times where she's like, oh, the cards told me something was going to happen, but I didn't see this coming. And it's like, right. That's the point lady. Like, that's why, like, even the stranger keeps showing up, and he's like, "I have a role to play. Things are going to happen." She's like, "Well, I don't like it," and he's like, "Yeah, man. yeah." <laughs> so I don't think she's one note. I mean, I think she's consistent. That doesn't necessarily make her one note. I think right. I agree with the assessment that she is. She feels like a relatively well fleshed out character. I believe her that she's making decisions based on some sort of framework of logic. It's not mm-hmm. like she's just like, "And today, I'm going to do this for no reason." Uh, yeah. So. Uh, I, I don't I don't have a problem with their characterization in that sense, but I do find her to be kind of not the bumbling idiot of history, but a little bit of just kind of like, whoa, magic, weird. It's like, but you're supposed to know that. Like and and, and that's Would one you of the say things she's the Doctor Who of magic. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> and that's one of the things that's kind of um I find interesting about her, but also i I find interesting or problematic in the physical representation in in that she's she's youth obsessed. Until she manages to tri- not trick death, but play a game with death, basically, to mm-hmm. kind of settle that score, in a sense. And she's clearly a creature who uses her sexual wiles mm-hmm. to manipulate people. Mm-hmm. And 
all of that is is fine on its face, but then when you have someone who's presented in that kind of young way, like I think it, I feel like that all amplifies up the naivete and amplifies, at least in my mind, kind of an a s- unconscious of like she doesn't necessarily know what she's doing. I don't know. There's something about all those factors combined that diminishes her authority to me, and it's and I'm try I've been trying to put my finger on it exactly. Yeah, it's hey. it's hard for me to really define what it is because that- I. Because I want to be absolutely clear, a woman exercising her sexual agency is, you know, like that is not diminishing of her character or her person. Like none of those Mm. factors individually make me think, oh, this character can't get it done. She just, you know, sleeps with people to get her way. Like that's not it. It's Is it because like she's supposed to be an authority on this subject of magic, but she's not an authority? Because... I think that that is purposefully done. Now, there's a lot of ambiguity about this character and a lot of rewriting has been done in the history books here. Like, this is a retroactive retelling of these events. Absolutely. They did not, this is not canon stuff until right now in this brand new series. He's filling in the gaps in older comics and stuff that existed before comics. Sure, so he might be tying threads together that are kind of separate. But he's also tying together two different disparaging universes that never existed together because this is all pre-crisis right dc and a lot of the characters that she meets are characters that kind of like got written back into the same world interacting with the vertigo universe this is one of the few series i can point to that has both dc characters and vertigo characters that was written after 1985 um just like oh I was just going to say that like magic is really complicated in the DC universe. Oh, There's yes. so much that fucks it up all the time because you have players like the Spectre who is the uh, you know the uh the the vengeance of God. God's wrath made spectral, made physical, physical but he's spectral. So it's confusing. <laughs> God's wrath made a thing and then it can fight people. But then you also have the endless in this story and you have the magic on the level that like John Constantine deals with right. magic. And even John is like, eh, magic's kind of like a weirdy. It's a weird thing. You just It's not about having the right ingredients. It's about, it's about having the right intent. Right. And, like, well, and the, the death, death says, says that. that yeah. Book. Right. And and John John says that all the time. And there are also I mean, there are ages of magic in the DC universe. Absolutely. Literally, it's like new age of magic. The rules are now different. Right. And you have guys like Zatara who like lived in a totally different time that she's tying him bound. And you have Zatanna who comes up like the magic is very complicated in the DC universe. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I think maybe this is kind of the author's commentary on that. There's like even though she is the authority on magic some stuff still slips through because it's weird. Yeah. The, this whole series felt kind of strangely disjointed to me because I couldn't really find a strong through line of this is Madame Xanadu's arc. She starts here, she ends here, and this is how she gets from point A to point B. A lot of the story is, here's a story where something important happened in the DC universe as told from the perspective of Madame Xanadu who happened to be there. Like, that's the, how the I, first arc the, starts. What's anyway. that? That's the first trade, anyway. Right. Well, I mean, you've got like the Green Lanterns, mm-hmm. Lantern, the the Alan Scott Golden Age Green right. Lantern, which was who's a magical based character. Right. And you've got the creation of the Spectre, and um, there was another story in there where it was like, oh, it's this thing from like the DC universe where it's just kind of like this thing is happening, and also Madame Xanadu is there. Yeah, there's a lot of characters like that. Um, Etrigan well, was one. Yeah, the um, creation of Etrigan. Yeah, Etrigan and the Demon, yeah. Um, um, I wrote them down. Yeah. Um, but that's that all happens in the first 10 like, issues. Mm, right. Well, it kind of happens throughout. And to me, I guess well, that I mean, was the thread. It was, this is what's been happening in the DC and Vertigo, uni- Vertigo universe. And this is kind of this common thread that ties them together. Like, Xanadu is the thread of this is what's been happening and this is how this character is related to that and also this is why magic is weird i i think that why the series feels disjointed is because those first 10 feel, deal very much with like these are important events in the dc universe and here's madame xanadu right but then after trade two it's like well but this is madame xanadu's story yeah and it and- feels very much more like the sandman of Madame Xanadu, where it's like, it's just kind of like mini arcs, and like right. maybe eventually we'll get to this like larger story, and then the right. larger story and just never the comes. Like, there, there was a certain point of reading this where I was like, 
are they ever going to bring these things together? And they brought some of them together, like w- dealing with Morgan Le Fay. Like, yes. I'm glad that they actually did that because I was like, are they ever going to get back to that? Yeah. Like the whole thing with Merlin and all of that. Like it just felt like they were just like, okay. Like I realize I'm saying like and kind of jumping around a lot. It feels disjointed in the way that real life is just disjointed where mm. maybe you don't get the answer to something because a thing happens and then you go to another continent and hundreds of years pass mm-hmm. and you don't get the answer. But mm. as a reader reading a story, I found it unsatisfying. And as an author, you have the ability to tell stuff out of order. And he did tell stuff out of order. But right. Why choose this order? <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, I mean, they did get back and they did wrap up some of those things. And that kind of satisfied some of my qualms. But again, like I just, I didn't feel like there was this strong through line where I'm like, this is what this series is mm. about. Well, it was more just here's Madame Xanadu and this is who her character is. And this is a bunch of stuff that happened to her. I feel like it might be the drift that comes from a lack of a timetable. I feel like this is my problem with the swamp thing as mm. well, where it's like, we're going to start a new thing and these new creators are making something and then it's just going to go. And so, you know, this is where we're going to do the five issue arc about, you know, like a noir, like a noir, like story. Mm. And it's like, we don't have to go back and resolve those things yet. Oh, uh, last issue. We need to resolve a couple things like, um, yeah. I wonder how this would read in single issues because this was still not that being... great. If I remember. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I was working at the comic book store while this was coming out and I remember picking up issues of this. And not knowing what the hell is going on. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Because it is very... Uh, so, I I love this series, personally. Like, mm-hmm. I have a lot of fondness for this series. But I have a lot of fondness for it because of the things that I like about magic. And especially once it hits Trade 3. Like, Trade 2, I think, is really cool. Like, I like the jumping back and forth. The t- like, oh, this is she's been living for a really long time. And then this is what consequences mean. Like, I, I, I find Trade 2 to be really satisfying on its own. And then Trade 3 is satisfying for a couple different reasons. I think that the art in Trade 3 is all fantastic. I think the art really hits its stride at that point. But I also feel like the storytelling really hits its stride because it does... It has the ability to tell you kind of two short stories that are connected. You have the short story about the woman who's going through all these physical changes and her husband is like, what's going on with you? And she's losing her hair. And, and I think and, that was one of the strongest. Parts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you have the, that like weird uh, cult that's like not really a Satanist cult. They just like, like to get together to hang out. And Martian um, Manhunter. And Martian Manhunter. And you have, you have like a lot of little like nuggets dumped in where it's mm-hmm. like you have this tiny story and then you have Madame Xanadu shows up and she ties this thing to that event and then John Jones is there and then um, you get the resolution of the Morgan Le Fay stuff that you were really waiting for. If the whole series was that, yeah. this would be one of my favorite series of yeah, all time. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think that the, the series suffers from not having a strong antagonist. Yeah. Except for Morgan Le Fay who is kind of there at the beginning of volume one in the first two issues and then not again until volume three. Mm. So it's, my... Oh, sorry. Go no, ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Okay. I did not like Morgan Le Fay. <laughs> as, like, as, you, you hated her I, because she was hateable as a villain? Or no, because like she's basically presence? Raven Hex from Tarot Witch of the Black Rose without nipple blades. Just like okay. the only interesting thing about that character. Well, <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna <laughs> lie. Not I'm not gonna pretend. But, I I have not read Terra Witch of the Black. Okay, Rose, Kayla, so, so explain to me what that character is. Okay, the, so for those at home, I know it's a very popular book, but someone may not have read it. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> also, you guys should listen to the back matter that oh, we I've, did I've, on this. I've, I've listened to that. Good. That um, <laughs> didn't help so me. Raven did Hex is a character. No. Uh, Raven Hex is a character who is basically evil for evil's sake. Like she doesn't have any real motivation, and she's mm. also queen of the goblins. And she also is like, I was underground for all these years, and now somehow my teeth are pointy, and ah ha ha, I'm so evil. Yeah, and what's, what's I that don't Power Ranger like. Rita Repulsa. Yes. Or if you're in the Japanese, Bendora. <laughs> <laughs> I like how you said that. That's he how, also did a really great pose. It. It's so great. I um, love it. <laughs> but like Morgan Le Fay to me 
isn't a character. Like she's just kind of a thing that happens. Mm. Um, and I've definitely seen her in ways that are interesting and that was not done well in yeah, this book. I definitely agree with um, you on that. She was very she was one note. She yeah. was just kind of like, haha, I'm evil and I'm going to destroy this woman's life by possessing her body, even though there's no real good reason for me to do that. Right. There was and no explanation also, as why that was even necessary. Yeah. I was living underground. So why didn't she just come out? From yeah, why didn't she just Because come, of magic, Brand come back up out the, whole, of the hole you okay. went uh, down into. Always magic. All right. I'm going to interrupt for just a second. Okay, and then I'm going to respond to Toby. Don't let me forget that I yeah, disagree I have to res- with Toby. Yeah, I have to respond to Toby as well, <laughs> but I'll let forget. you do that part first. So the, the, the whole magic thing. Tobias, you mentioned earlier that one of the things that happens in the DC universe is that the law, the rules of magic change. That is bullshit post 30 or 40 years ad hoc editorial being like, uh, why is our shit inconsistent? Oh, uh, magic changes all the time. Yeah. Like, the reason D, like magic in DC is so complicated, and actually it's complicated in everything because there's a because it's not real. <laughs> well, so here's there's this there's this Whoa. there's a very interesting body of work that one could dive into if you wanted to about mm-hmm. basically that the reason people often write using magic is either because they don't think about it mm-hmm. and they don't want to, or they specifically don't want to create a more science based system. And then there, and there's incredibly robust arguments now about basically like hardcore fantasy where systems of magic must make logical sense or have rules and whatever. And so neither comic company has done that consistently, which is why you can have someone like Dr. Strange running around being like, I have the eye of Agamotto. And what does it do? Well, I mean, a bunch of stuff really it makes toast it opens portals to other worlds uh but it doesn't work against plaid and uh guys carrying copper pipes i i don't know you know agamotto's a crazy guy you know same thing with uh uh the dc universe yeah. i mean green lantern was probably the most logical of them all and yeah, his, it doesn't he, work against wood yeah and his whole thing is still it doesn't work against wood yeah it's just like well why your your thing is like the heart of a, a tree you know uh yeah who knows but magic is weird magic so <laughs> was it like I'm shrugging a lot that during things all that were not wrought by the hand of man or something yeah like that? i don't know some weird thing but yeah, that that's my just little tirade about magic. Yeah, no, I mean it so. it is definitely because like well how many writers do you think wrote for DC between the oh, yeah. its inception and when well, this book came DC, out like but all the companies that DC that DC absorbed plus of magic a company. change in like the entire notion of shared world building editorial oversight about the the, the multi universe the multiverse I mean, shit. Like, I mean we yeah. complain now still about things that don't make sense, you know. I mean, yeah. But I mean Magic has been making sense for a long ass time. That's spoilers true. world. Um, <laughs> spoiler alert. Magic also in the DC universe, even the characters admit that it's complicated, and I think that that maybe, I mean, I'm sure that that's a response to the fact that like, yeah, well, and I think it's helpful it was, to at least have have right. occasionally the characters be like almost fourth wall slyly right. and everybody like yeah we know it's magic's weird up. right mm-hmm. um but yeah, i mean i would i'm always glad to have a in universe like hey we figured out how to make the thing that doesn't make sense make sense by slapping this band-aid on top of it. right but and you I, were going to respond to something honestly. i was i was also going to respond to brand really quickly where it's like you know some people like to come up with a very complicated logical magic system but it's like you know does it affect in in comic books where you have 22 pages like is it really logical to spend oh sure X, Y, Z amount of time think, to like draw diagrams of how the magic works. No, I like. think the best way I've ever heard it put was in Gunner Creek Court, which I'm really mad that it got pitched again and we haven't voted for it. Um, is that magic is just ethereal science, which is science we have not explained yet. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I, and once you explain it, it's not magic anymore, it's science. Right. I don't like that explanation of magic. I'm yeah. not a fan of it. I think it depends on how it's executed. My favorite type of magic is kind of what they do in the DC universe, which is about it's more reliant on intent than mm. anything else. Like those tend to be my favorite types of magic systems where it's like I like it when you like make someone pick a card out of a deck and then you're like, Is this your card? And then it's wrong. And so, then they're like, No, and then you're okay, like, How about can this I tell one? you <laughs> can I tell you that for a split second, I thought you were gonna say when you make someone pick a car and I thought you were like going back down the Mighty Morphin Power Ranger thing, or I was like, What? <laughs> and then you're like card out of it. I was like, Oh, okay. Yeah. 
It's a card trick joke. <laughs> Keep up. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just like, man, he's really on a Power Ranger thing. I'm, a, I'm into it. No, um, I was going to respond to Toby because you said yes. that you think the one thing that keeps the series from really succeeding is that it doesn't have a clear antagonist. And I think that that is false because... Hellblazer's been going for what three hundred issues without a clear antagonist. Like that's what that series is all about. Like John's biggest antagonist is himself. Exactly. I would that argue that Madam Xanadu's biggest. Okay. Well, let me let me cohesive. Let me rephrase that then. Not so much that it doesn't have it as an antagonist, as mm-hmm. there is no specific source of dramatic conflict. Yeah, and I think that in the format that it is, like kind of these short stories, like you will get a new source of conflict in every story, as I think you should in short right, stories. Right, which is why I say it, it feels sort of disjointed. It yeah. doesn't come together with any sort of strong core, this is what the series is about moment. So let me see how this fits for you folks. Um, I think one of the strongest pieces of this entire series is actually the the um, possession of is it Beth, I think, and the reemergence of Morgana. Mm-hmm. Her Morgana's value as a villain aside, I think the actual like like the interesting social commentary yeah. aspects yes. of it, the slice of life aspects mm-hmm. of it, Xanadu is a present figure but isn't the only character yeah. portion of it. I feel like it's this really great equilibrium that if that was the heart and soul of the series i think the series would have enjoyed a nice long life or could have at least been sustained i think that the critical failure from my perspective is they change that equilibrium and then it's greg record did a run on punisher recently and i bring it up it's actually been like two or three years now but he his his focal point for this run is he wanted to present the punisher as a force of nature Mm -hmm. so the story wasn't about frank castle it was about people running into Frank Castle and I feel like that's what happened with Madame Xanadu is that two thirds of the way through the series it suddenly became about stories about people who ran into Madame Xanadu and I think the intent was to make commentary about the nature of Xanadu and what she's like and what she does and how she reaches people but I think it switched that equilibrium that was actually very successful earlier well, and I, that's where I feel like their failing becomes it's not a lack of a strict antagonist it's right. about how much of Xanadu is present in the story and and how does the conflict cycle around her needs, goals, wants, concerns, and challenge her as a character? Yeah, and I think that w- one of the reasons why it kind of shifts focus or why stories like this tend to shift focus is they are aping older Vertigo storytelling styles. Like I think Sandman does that very specifically. There are stories that are told from Morpheus's point of view with Morpheus as the focus, and there are stories where he is this force of nature that comes in, solves a problem, goes away. I, like I, I think Neil does that really well in that series. Yeah, I, I honestly wonder if this series would read better to me if it actually started in the modern day with modern day Madame Xanadu mm-hmm. doing her Madame Xanadu thing and like running into the Phantom Stranger and Morgan Le Fay and like helping people with their problems and getting into trouble, and then goes like they do in the third volume where they're flashing back to her childhood with yeah. Morgana actually like go back and kind of slowly backfill in more of her history in Camelot and in Xanadu and the French revolution and all of those things like kind of draw you in with the more modern day superhero stuff and then slowly kind of well, backfill in her history. It's not modern day superhero stuff. All right. It's modern day detective stuff. Yeah, sure. Like okay. she is a detective. Yeah, yeah absolutely. right. Like she's a she's a spirit All right, detective. The, the, the modern day DC milieu. Yeah. No, I, I of, agree with you. Of Martian Manhunter and the Spectre, Jim Corrigan, and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I could see that. Um, also, quick side note: I am slowly, actually, not even slowly, rapidly falling in love with Martian Manhunter. I think any How could you not any book that he is a part of. And any cartoon that he was a part of, it's instantly 300 times better, in my opinion. He's and, the heart of the Justice League. Yeah. He's amazing. He's a great character. He's just fantastic. You and should I, really read Justice League International and let me know how you feel about Martian Manhunter. Okay. I, I think he's good in that. What's no, he's great. Oh, okay. <laughs> but it's a <laughs> like, very different kind of take <laughs> on him. 
It's like mom. And you'll never look at Oreos the same way. Uh, I loved him on Smallville. Were you on the new frontier? Yes. And that's okay. kind so, of like, I always liked him in Justice mm-hmm. League and stuff. Um, I was just like, oh, look, he's got his pack of Oreos. And then I read that and I was just like, wow, he's amazing. Yeah. So, I wonder how amazing. you feel about the Ms. Martian stuff from the 90s. <sighs> <laughs> what about it? Did you watch Young Justice? I'm watching it right now. It's pretty you know, bad, right? Happy about it. Well, I like it, but <laughs> I don't like it. I, I, no, I, I do like look. it, and I actually I find Robin like kind of adorable because he does a lot of my favorite wordplay things. But yeah. Miss Martian is just like I can't stand the way that she's written. So there's two seasons. Have you finished the first season yet? No. Finish the first season, start the second season, then and tell then, me what you think about Miss yeah, Martian. Yeah. Because holy shit. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, Brand, I don't like it. Brand was giving me a funny look. There was an episode that ended <laughs> with me yelling, fuck you, Joe, podcast over because we were talking about Young Justice. Oh. Uh, I don't want, I think it could be better. I think it could be a lot better. Well, sure, it could be better, but it's so good much better than so many other things. I disagree. I think that Justice League was better. I think Justice League Unlimited was better. I think Teen Titans was better. I have to argue with you on that point, but I'm not yeah, going to do it right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> there is one other thing about this book that I Teen wanted Titans to bring up because it bothered me, and since we're on the topic of things bothering us, in the first two issues, her weird stag shoes that look like weird, like giant wedge hooker shoes with no... I didn't even notice these. So, <laughs> okay, so at the very beginning, she's wearing basically imagine like giant wedge high heels with no actual heel that make it look like she has stag feet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she All looks labels. like a satyr. Right, yes. I, under, I th- like I recognize what they were trying to do visually. It still disturbed me. Hmm. I thought it was a kind of a clever nod, like maybe some of the things like some of the creatures of myth are actually just people like Xanadu. Who mm. we, I mean, yeah, it's never necessarily explained why she dressed that way. Well, I mean, she had a whole stag thing going on with the I, horns and the shoes. Right. I like, think that didn't bother me because I've seen and worn those type of shoes. Yeah. Where they're I, like, they counter your balance. So you don't need a heel. And okay. so I was just like, yeah, those are just shoes that you wear. I've I've seen, I know what kind of shoes you're talking about. Yeah. I just, I guess I have a viscerally negative reaction to that style of shoe because I have a strong association with it in my mind with strippers in the sex industry. And what's wrong with strippers, Toby? There's nothing wrong, what's wrong with, with strippers the sex as long industry? as they I'm have Tobiah. agency I'm, and aren't being exploited by okay. the patriarchy. I'm sorry. So Do they have the, she's purely wearing, for the amusement of men. Were so they, she's wearing these shoes and you're assuming it's for the patriarchy? Yes, I am. Even though she is in a relationship with a woman? Well, and, she's in a uh, relationship with a woman later. but Later, yeah. but is, I mean. This is page one, issue one. I know, but we're I not. I look at those shoes and I go, that's a weird choice. Why did they, right? did they have, were they plastic and they had goldfish in them? They were not and they <laughs> did not. And those after, are stripper after shoes. After a little bit, after I had seen it drawn a bunch more times, I'm like, okay, she's going for a stag foot kind of design. But my first reaction to it is, that's weird. Why is she wearing stripper shoes? Also, s- stripper shoes are like, they're supposed to be flashy because you're a stage performer. Yes. And yeah. like, that's the point. But hookers, it doesn't matter because like, you don't wear the shoes during it your job. Well, it matters because they need to be comfortable to get you to and from jobs. Well, I was, I was going to make the argument like, that in most cases, hookers... Or, hookers are not dressing for comfort. You, yeah, they're well, dressing. I mean, it they're depends dressing, on what kind of. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I, I hate throwing the word hooker around. Yeah, I know. It I know depends that. on what well, I'm stuttering. I'm like, is there a better word? Sex yeah, worker. Sex well, worker. Yeah, but but, I but sp- specifically a, a sex worker who goes and has sex for money. Uh, right. They they can definitely dress for comfort because they need to like get to the job and yeah. then go in and then they don't need to wear their shoes anymore. Right? Anyway, <laughs> they need to Sorry, I brought it up. Oh, oh, well, God. if they're standing on the street, street advertising, but not every lady who sleeps with someone for money for sex needs to advertise on the street. Hashtag maybe not they all sex workers already <laughs> have an established <laughs> business clientele. Yeah, maybe they're further but along maybe in their business plan. Them in like the hotel lobby, they need to look. Maybe. What if you're not going to a hotel lobby? What if you're going to like a weird shady motel with those what like walk in doors? Yeah. What if yeah. you're going out? That are my favorite hotels. What then? 
What about a, yeah, anyway. dumpster behind Arby's? I think we're talking about very different classes of. <laughs> I like the dumpster behind the Arby's idea mostly because I feel like it would smell like Arby's, and that is nothing, that, <laughs> nothing, nothing sexier than the smell of Arby's. <laughs> Maybe just because it all reminds me of old people. Um, Kaylee, you had some more stuff to say, I think. Um, do, 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 let me see real quick. Um, I really love Amy Reader's art. Me too. And I know that earlier, and I didn't get to address this, uh, Toby, you talked about her looking young and naive and that sort of taking away from, I guess, the gravity that she has. Yeah. In a number of ways. And I wonder, and this is why we should have a more diverse podcast panel, just saying. I wonder. Well, they're welcome what, to be here if they show up. I know. Um, <laughs> how <laughs> other women would feel about that. Because I know for me personally, I'm oftentimes not taken seriously because I have a round chubby face and I am all of five foot two with my boots on. Um, and in order for people to take me seriously, I have to draw myself up to my full height and pretty much start yelling. Um, and wear business suits. Uh, business like, suits don't work because they're like, look at that child in a business <laughs> suit. <laughs> you think they would like add an air of authority? No, well, not really. They like yell so well. Yeah. I, I think that there are small, young female characters that are still able to convey an air of power and authority. Like, and I didn't get that from Madame Xanadu. Like Kamala Khan? Uh, yeah, Kamala Khan, uh, Battle Angel Aelita, uh, Molly Hayes, Cassandra Kane. But, yeah. I want to say for my part, I don't. it's not that I feel like there's a lack of gravitas, it's just that I feel like when, and I'm speaking specifically, when compared to other representations of Xanadu, um, Amy Reader's specific portrayal of her seems like it, it tilts the character's actions visually to be more okay in a weird way. And like I was saying, it's like it's not just that. It's like the weird things all caught. Because like so the ver- this, this book had a little bit of the Vertigo HBO problem, at least in my mind, where it's like all of a sudden like partway through it's like nudity. And sex and all this stuff, and I'm like, is this necessary? Is this intentional? I mean, so if she's an old world, right. I know up those ratings. I know, but it's like <laughs> you know, it's it's like, well, I mean, she's an old world character. Sexual agency was the thing, even as early as Merlin. Like, this, all that's fine, but it felt like at times, like she's in the court of the Khan, and she's dressed in a way that might be feminine, but is in no way sexualized. But the closer she gets to modern time, the more and more just like sexy outfits she's wearing. And I'm just kind of like, why? Do you think she wears sexy outfits? I well, she dressed like a grandma. No, yeah, like she wears that giant, like she's got like, yeah, yeah sometimes and sometimes she's got like the, the half top, like Esmeralda from. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes from, you're, 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 you're right. Nylon slit. And she, yeah. She wears and nylon garters, slit and heel. And I slit tight. And I mean, it's not. And like I said, like that in of itself isn't an issue. It's just, that I feel like there was a weird mixing of her representation. Mm-hmm. And so I was trying. So I guess here was the thing. The disadvantage of having a, a non linear, not even linear, but a, a, a clear arc of character clear rules of the road from a design perspective, whether that's because you have the same artist working the entire time or because there's a strong editorial oversight. I feel like it makes me feel mixed about knowing whether or not Xanadu like, is she is she just someone who happens to find herself sexually engaged with men of pa- of a certain kind of power, like magical power, like literal power? Um, or is it that she actually uses her sex in a way to affect outcomes with those types of people? Like there are circumstances where clearly she is using her sexual agency. Now, was that intentional or was that just, yeah, we got to get more ratings. Uh, uh, you, you're the new artist. Uh, what do you think? Well, I think a good noir outfit would be, a, you know, three inch stilettos in a, in a couple of thigh high slits on her dress. I mean, I think that it was intentional, if for uh, no other reason than controversy. Like, they could... Like, within her time? Or controversy within her... Within the comic book. Yeah. Boost ratings by doing something controversial, like... But it's not controversial to sexualize a woman's body in a comic. It's mild by comparison to other 
outfits that female characters wear. No, but you start hinting that here is a a woman with magical power (laughs) who uses sex. Well, it's implied that she does use sex to solve some problems to help her solve problems. But I don't I don't think that ever boosted ratings on the book because I remember when this was coming out, like nobody talked about that. Right. It was no. a vertigo well, series. Well they see, they say that it was. Yeah, but they didn't though. It 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 it's a vertigo series. Like it didn't sell well in singles. They no. just that's just how it works. It sold yeah. much better in the trade. Well that's why I found it confusing, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Like I don't have a I'm I really don't have a judgment about any of the specific points that I just right. brought up. I'm just kinda like why did they do it? Like, yeah, like yeah. why did why did it happen that way? I feel like, yeah, and what am I supposed her, to glean from it? Some I, of her costume designs were definitely questionable. Where it was like, I don't know, well, I think, what you're trying to get from this because it wasn't necessarily era or area appropriate. <laughs> well, um, and I think part of that was the point is that she's trying to look like an outsider to attract business for Madame Xanadu enter freely and whatever. Well, so yeah, like when she's in kind of the, what you'd almost call stereotypical style gypsy dress, like that seems thematically appropriate, even yeah. in the fifties, she's mm-hmm. like, I'm Madame Xanadu, I've got the scarf and the bangles and, ah, and it's like, okay, yeah. you're playing to the crowd. Right. right. But when she's in Mongolia, she, she does dress somewhat European. Yeah, right. She dresses so somewhat European. And again, I feel like mystery. Right. That's what I'm saying is that I feel like in those circumstances, I understand her costuming. It's more like when we get closer to the modern era and she's not costuming herself as quote Madame Xanadu, but she's running around in like, like I said, like a mini skirt or a, you know, a, 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 I don't even know what you call What do you call that kind of a dress? It's got like the thigh high slits on both sides. It's got like the slits on Uh, both sides. What is it? A pencil skirt? No, No, because the pencil skirt is. uh, It's like a long dress. It's like a floor length dress, but the slits on the sides come all the way up. So it's like like a a maxi skirt with. Biceps. Yeah, yeah, and so like there's, but there's a handful of those, of yeah. those kinds of costuming things where half the time she's kind of in her, you know, you Madame Xanadu you style uniform, appropriate for the age, right? Like showing her in France, she was clearly dressed to the French court standard, but mm-hmm. still as an outsider, like she had her normal hair instead of the powdered wig, like all that stuff. I guess. But then in certain circumstances, the closer you get to modern era, she's dressing in a mix of that costuming and what seemed like really strange choices. And I, I was like, well, I feel I'm that like one of her character points is that she's trying to seem unique. I could see that. I could see the, the I could see the, the argument going a couple different ways. Like one, is she trying to stand out? Is she trying to stand unique Two, two, is it the man out of time? Like, I don't know how to dress myself. Like, is it that, or is it just like that? It was an afterthought. Yeah. And then like the writer artist team never really sat down and decided like, right. Here's what she wears this needs to be fairly consistent throughout because especially in volume four where you have so many different guest artists penciling her, like how much, how many character templates like went back and forth because Madame Xanadu has existed as a character for years and years and years. Like what reference image did they look at before they drew her? You know, was it, was it a consistent thing? Well, I think that's what I was nodding to earlier about like kind of a lack of overarching. Yeah. Like I feel like a series like this succeeds better. 20 years later than it did 20 years ago. And of course, maybe you had to have the things happen. This was 7 to 10, right? 2007 to 2010? Yeah, roughly. 2008, I think. Yeah, it's two, I think it started in so, 2008. I don't know. I don't remember when it started. It was anyway, like right I started working in the comic book store in September of 2007. It was already going on, yeah. I think. Okay, well, it's 29 so issues, cool. so it was about a year. I keep thinking that the series is older... I keep thinking the series is older, uh, comparing it to things like Sandman that had these kinds of weird issues. Well, it's trying to ape that style, but I it's know, aping but, stuff that maybe isn't necessarily but, like the most successful parts of that, those. That actually reminds me. I had a quick question. Uh, when the Phantom Stranger grabs Marco Polo out in the desert at the beginning of that issue, that is a reference to when Marco Polo is lost in the desert in Sandman, right? I think, I think so. so. Okay. Mm-hmm. I wasn't sure if I, I was mis- misremembering that, up, that, that scene. Be. I don't. I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. I'm pretty I sure that remember. you see the exact same scene in Sandman, although it's not clearly the Phantom Stranger at that point. Yeah, I don't. Remember. Anyway, hmm. I think so. Side note: I know that there are references to a lot of different comics, in, especially in those early issues. Do you guys think the Phantom Stranger could be somebody we know from the DC universe? Like it's all Clark Kent also has a third secret identity. You mean like that? 
kind of, but <laughs> Clark Kent. Yeah, yeah but like a different guy. I know that they recently like maybe revealed Doctor Fate. No, no, they're not. Uh, he's, I mean, he's been his own. In the New 52, they recently revealed, like, this is the definitive origin of the Phantom Stranger. Back in the day, there were, like, two or three uh, contending backstories, one of which is that he's the wandering Jew from mythology, and another is that he is an angel who is kicked out of heaven, I think, for not taking a side in mm. the rebellion. And so he was cast out and basically forced into this role of guiding the hand of his or the wheel of history or whatever i um, i never knew that the phantom stranger until right now when you told me i never knew that the phantom stranger had an origin story i just thought yeah. they were always just like it's no. a guy the phantom stranger yeah. here he is that's why the reference to the, plot. <laughs> the angel at the beginning of the episode like uh, one of uh, one of his potential backstories is, is that he's an angel cast out of heaven ah uh, you know, okay and, and cursed sense. to wander the earth forever never finding a home anywhere but yeah anywhere. even before new 52 and various crises it's been established that he is his own person because he's shown up in a room with all the others <laughs> at the various yeah, well, times where magic has attempted to what if it's itself. like the the single universal electron theory brand and everyone is the same character well, what about that no um, that wouldn't make sense with magic no it wouldn't <laughs> uh oh, yeah i never I knew he could be like the anti-monitor or not anti-monitor the monitor that's but marvel like, no, no, no the monitor, monitor is from DC. From no, Crisis he's on the, he's the big guy on the big. He's got a big head. He's the monitor. He lives on the moon. No, the no, watcher. that's the watch. No, that's his monitor. No, he monitors every. All I do is monitor. <laughs> <laughs> I will not interfere. Right. Also dead. The monitor. Well, See, I mean I now. Like, okay, so you've got all these people like Justice League three thousand. Uh, yeah. You've got the. Um. You've got all these people who could time travel. What if one of them from the far future, like, created this alter ego, alter ego of the Phantom Stranger? That's, are you claiming started... that Booster Gold came back and decided to act <laughs> no, like Booster Gold Stranger? is not that intelligent? Hey, um, he 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 becomes Nova. That's Marvel, Brent. No, it's super <laughs> a supernova. Excuse me. You're um, right. Uh, I just thought that'd be interesting. Well, okay. Like, what if he went back in time, created this alter ego to go back in time and make sure history does exactly what he already knew it would do? Because the guy's yeah, always like, I'm not going to do anything. Right. Um, but the. Uh, <laughs> that's she would weird. Have to be like, because it's not even like he shows up and tells anybody to do anything. He's like, people are like, why are you here? He's like, because something's happening. Like, yeah, but what? And he's like, you know, stuff. I'm like he's so infuriated. He's like it. he's he he is the watcher in that regard. Yeah. He's just except for the fact that watcher keeps going. No, no, no! Turn the left lever. I will not I'm, interfere. I will not interfere. <laughs> Famous stranger is a better watcher than yeah. the watcher is. Um, but uh, in in Grant Morrison's All Star Superman, he has the bandaged Superman, who's basically like the same Actually, jam, right? So I'm pulling up Wikipedia. There are. Four possible versions of the Phantom Stranger's story, two Sweet. of which is he, he's a guy from biblical times, mm. one that he's an angel, <laughs> and another <laughs> is a proposal that the Phantom Stranger is a time-looped being who, at the end of the universe, approaches a group of scientists who are trying to drain a portion of the Big Bang to extend the life of the universe, uh, realizes that one of the scientists is, in reality, an avatar of anti-life, and it's going to drain energy from the Big Bang to prevent the universe from ever existing. Is that Grant Morrison? Yeah, I was going to say, that came from a fucking Grant Morrison book. <laughs> and, that gets, and he gets, like, time looped. That's basically. Grant Morrison. <laughs> if it's anti-life, man, that's got to be Grant. <laughs> the anti-life equation. It's either Jim uh, Starling or... No, it's, it's Dan Mishkin. <laughs> oh. Well, sorry, Dan Mishkin. A.K.A. <laughs> Grant, Morrison. <laughs> Grant Morrison time looped. Repeating history endlessly. <laughs> yeah, right. So there you go. Yeah, but they've never definitively said, as far as I know, unless something happened in the New 52, this is exactly who the Phantom Stranger mm. is. I liked you know, it well, better. See, and I I don't know. I was just like lost in my own world. I'm like, oh, what if he's this guy? What if he's this guy? Like every time I saw him. He is truly one of the most I mysterious characters. Try to take a guess of like. What about the question? Well, we know, know who the question is. The question is. <laughs> But, he, but he's a question. He's no, he asks no questions. Question. <laughs> no, he he, he's not. He, actually, <laughs> she. Okay, now. Questions. Well, now well, he again. 
Well, no. Yeah, there's been several questions. Because in the thing, they showed Renee Monte again, but did she carry forward to DCU, New you? Y-O-U-U, that's not, point that's now? That's not a thing anymore. They're done with that already. <laughs> yeah, which is interesting because, <laughs> of course, really? all the book, yeah, well, four months. Yeah. That's what they said. <laughs> wow. So uh, what's the next one? Yeah. Do not DC change anything. Me. DC me. Yeah, I was just going to say DC me. <laughs> My DC, my DC Wii U, <laughs> DC FU, the new DC Wii U. That's the next one. Yep. Um, the new 3D DC Wii U. Um, I like it better when you just like no one ever tried to explain his backstory because then he really is a stranger. Yeah, well, anyway, well, I mean, but mine was all just like conjecture. Oh yeah, sure, sure. Like, wouldn't it be fun if? This was so and so from the future who had to come back to this moment as the Phantom Stranger and do what though he doesn't this he doesn't do anything well, to though. stop somebody from doing something but he never does anything I'm here to stop somebody Bye. from doing what something <laughs> <laughs> tell us more I can't <laughs> because it's already happened it passed I can leave now <laughs> except for the one time where a bunch of motherfuckers get in my way I'm gonna melt your spears with my well, okay fire. so he comes to England. Specifically to not stop Jack the Ripper so that right. something else can happen. Like, Well, to make sure that Jack the Ripper isn't stopped until he kills a particular So he's just person. like protecting. He's just like, nope, don't touch that. Like, he's pushing. time cop. <laughs> okay, so there you go. He's, he's Jean-Claude Van Damme. This is the worst fan theory of all time. I'm just drawing he's a line in the sand. He's back to ensure that no one corrupts the timeline. Exactly. Uh, because if he goes home, if somebody screws something up, he's going to go home and he's not going to have a wife and kids will have and faded from be, that picture that he had of the dance and the that's the weirdest under thing the about. sea john claude van <laughs> damme john claude van damme at the something under the sea dance that's the weirdest hey. thing about his character in this book is that he's like the book of fate cannot be changed yeah. so what are you doing here to make sure that nothing changes he doesn't do anything <sighs> I like uh, the fan story. I really wish is, somebody would show up in a DC book and he'd be like, blah, 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 blah. And they'd be like, you're an asshole. <laughs> well, <laughs> That's what Madame Xanadu does. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, she does. exactly she what does. she does. That's the she best does. part about that. Every time she, she, he shows up in the second half of the book, he's like, I hate you. Yeah, go away. She, she's like, <laughs> what are you the fuck? Go away. I don't like <laughs> anything that you're about. I don't like what you're doing. I don't like that you're here. <laughs> I like that. And poor Zatara is like, you know him? <laughs> it's yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. I Don't ask that. how I know it. Yeah. God, what a jerk. He's an immortal. We hung dick. out a few times. Yeah. Um, anyway. Do you guys have a wish list for any characters that did not appear in this? Because there's like a bunch of crossovers, but anybody that did not appear in this. I was really hoping the Hell Etrigan and Jason Blood thing would come back up, mm -hmm. especially to be like, because again, that was kind of a thing that she had an opportunity to potentially interfere with, right? That's right. the whole thing the Phantom Stranger is giving her a hard time for. Is like you, like you didn't, you're too blind to see that the guy you're sleeping with is even doing this crap. So I would have loved an interaction with Jason Blood some amount of time later, where he's like, "Oh, you didn't help me deal with this at the time, huh?" Mm -hmm. You know, or Etrigan being like, "Hey, pretty lady from afar, thanks for letting me in the bar." You know, whatever the hell you'd say, but. Is he rhyming all the time? He used to. Mm. He's a rhyming demon. That was the class of demon he is. Mm. I think that's a class four demon. <laughs> Out of how many classes, <laughs> one would know because magic and magic is weird. complicated. Yeah. <laughs> uh, class four of X3 and 79. But I also like when Phantom Stranger gets mad at people for doing what he would have done, which is nothing. Yeah. He's like, why did you not interfere? He's like, why didn't you do anything? You, you, you're, well, the, I can't. you're the scary magic guy. I can't interfere. You well, had, what's why what's that you? line from, You had Super Kill Guy with you, and you still got caught. What's that line from <laughs> Futurama where Bender's like, he's talking to God, and he's like, do you know everything I'm ever going to do? And God's like, yeah. And Bender says, what if I don't, what if I do something else? And he says, well, then I wouldn't know that. <laughs> 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 oh, Futurama. Classic. God, it's one of my favorite episodes. I have a degree from the Empire uh, Evergreen State College. You have a degree in baloney. <laughs> yeah. Good it's old a, Olympia jokes. Great line. Um, Did you guys... Well, okay, so Brad said his. Did you guys have wish list characters that did not appear? Um, they're not the whole appearing whole in this film? I mean, Captain Marvel is my favorite character in the DC universe, so and I'm magic. always down for... Him or Shazam, the Wizard, or the Stone of Eternity, but like all of that stuff kind of happened way earlier, yeah, like five thousand BC or whatever. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, in terms of like DC magic characters, I mean, we had the Green Lantern's lamp. We had Etrigan, the we Spectre, had, uh, Doctor Fate's helmet. Yep, like kind of all the big ones. Zata- is Zatanna in this? Nope. Zatara is. Yeah, Zatara, Zatara is referenced, yeah. though. Okay. Yeah, because she says, you know, you're destined to have a greater love than me. Mm-hmm. I see it, and then you'll have a daughter whose love will captivate you more than anything I could ever hope to accomplish. Yeah. But um, I always like the Zatanna, uh, Madame Xanadu team up. I well, would have there, liked to see well, more Constantine and Swamp Thing. Well, luckily, they both have like 400 issue runs. <laughs> <laughs> but I want them both of which this. include Madame Xanadu, I think, right? I don't know. I'd have to. I think they out. both do. They? I, I think so. I'm, I'm sure. Oh, I know that there is a scene that I have read where Constantine is like getting kicked out of Madame Xanadu's office. Because she's like, nope, go away. I'm not going to help you. And he's like, but you said anyway. Nope, not you. Yeah, I know they interact in the new 52, but because they're on that same sweet Justice League team that sucks. Um, yeah, super League sweet. Dark. It was such a bad book. Um, I wanted to like that so bad. <laughs> I was like, yes, everything, this is for me. No, it's not. I'm pretty sure she's also wearing invisible high heels in that too. Well, she also wears these, like, I don't know. She has a bad character like, design. In like, the not even, like, shoes. Like, she's barefoot, but she's standing on her tippy toes for no reason. Oh, like Tara, Witch of the Black Rose. That happens in because that, too. Because some people too. don't know how to draw <laughs> women who aren't wearing high heels. Hmm. I just really love Taro, obviously. Is that what you're wearing? It's, <laughs> yeah. it's a facet of the, of the New 52 that just that doesn't exist. Women, women are oh. always wearing high heels. And Their muscles honestly, have like formed in a way yes. so which they like no matter where you go. Always walk like that. But are we are we ready to move on to Rex? Do we have anything else that we really really want to say about Madame Xanadu? <laughs> Why? I I like it. I mean, as this far book, as it exists in this weird place right. in the DC canon that yes. kind of came about shortly, like after Infinite Crisis, like right around Final Crisis right before new 52 and it kind of like touched on all this stuff that I really liked. Like I yeah. like when you get into that, like the deep history mm-hmm. of these fantastical universes, like in Marvel, when they go back like hundreds of years and it's like, it's apocalypse before he was a super villain right. or, you know, it's the second host of the celestials and this crazy thing happened, like kind of dealing with the repercussions of there being immortal characters who are around in the, the modern day, they had to have done things earlier. Right. And I like that aspect yes. of it, but the story itself doesn't really come together for me. Well, and I like I like a lot of that, and I think that it conflicts with itself because of the fact that the universe was rebooted at one point. Yeah. But I like it when it goes back and kind of like touches on the fact that there was a Silver Age, like Alan yeah. Scott and Wesley Dodds did it did in fact exist. Yeah, because absolutely. for a while they like wrote that out. I like that it kind of I, like flushes I out. Really did like the callback to Wesley Dodds. It was cool. He helped her yeah. fight a demon. With a did do that. sleeping gas gun. Yeah, and he was the superhero, the Sandman, before Neil Gaiman created Yeah, that right. right. The go- that's what I'm talking about. That guy, yeah. Wesley Dodds, yes. when he fights a demon with her. And I just think that's cool because since Neil Gaiman's Sandman, you know, the, the original Sandman fell out of flavor. Well, well, and so I and they're that, golden age mission. characters. Well, so I mean, like, keep in mind though, by the time this book was being pr- produced, JSA had a, was actually relatively well lauded, and Sandman was right. actually well. Dodds had died and had passed his his stuff on, but I mean, right? Like and his his legacy and his position in the DC universe was actually in force and acknowledged. Robinson did that in Starman, not in JSA. Well, I'm just saying Starman that Starman meets Dodds a lot, right? And well, I'm just saying about Sand is is a functioning member of JSA, right? Who Dodds gave it? Who's Dodds stuff? Basically, kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Which I is, just thought that that was cool. Yeah, I thought that I, I missed that character. Like, here you go, keep kid. In mind, it's a bunch of crap from the '40s. <laughs> also, still it's got works. demon blood on it, so <laughs> you might want to wash that near mid. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I kid. No, that's fine. I, I stopped reading comics like in 2005, 2006. And um, so at the time I was reading comics, like they hadn't really brought the JSA back. Yeah. Um, and it was cool. I always loved him. 
Yeah, I like... And once again, a great character from Smallville. <laughs> <laughs> I like all of the the Golden Age stuff, and so I'm glad it kind of like was able to sort of retread that ground. And for people who like the magic stuff, like Sandman and Lucifer and Constantine and, and read all that stuff, I think this is really cool. And I think Madame Xanadu is such an underutilized character with so much potential that this series only began to scratch the surface of that I it makes me want more Madame Xanadu series. Mm-hmm. So. That's how I feel about it. There, there is one thing that I wanted to note that I liked that took place at the, like the very, very end, which is almost a throwaway line, where she's talking about how like she couldn't see stuff related to her, mm. so she can see what's going on until she becomes involved. Yeah, and then she loses her ability to know anything about what's going on. That's I thought that was a cool plot. Yeah, and I, yeah. I think that that is a good explanation of why characters who are known for like their foresight and their ability to predict events can be surprised by things. Yeah. Maybe that is why the Phantom Stranger can take no action. Because he doesn't know what's going on. He's like, I'm here to stop. Oh, now I'm involved. <laughs> well, because now I know if that. he <laughs> takes an action, then he can't see the mm-hmm. outcome. Yeah, Maybe. that's the thing. Like, he can never become actively involved. All he can do is tell so people he's the things best watcher to convince him to do that. things. <laughs> anyway. But yeah, let's move on to, to recommendations. All right. Kaylee, would you like to go first? Sure. So I am pitching, if it just came out in trade, Lady Killer Volume mm-hmm. 1 by Jamie S. Rich and Joelle Jones. Um, it follows a homemaker slash secret assassin uh, in the <laughs> like, like late, yeah, sure. late 50s. Um, she is the perfect wife, mother, um, Susie Homemaker type woman. And then... She uses that sort of as a disguise to kill people a lot. Yep. Uh, And it's the art is absolutely fantastic. The story is also fantastic. And I just really like. Colored by the phenomenal Laura Allred. Is it? Yeah, Laura colored that book. Whoa, I didn't know that. I don't know how I didn't know that. Why uh, why the colors are so good. Oh, there you go. (laughs) Uh, that actually explains a lot about the colors. Um, but yeah, it's it's gorgeous. It's a great read. Um, it has all the things I like, um, which is like mystery, strong female character. doesn't have any magic in it yet. I'm sure that will <laughs> come eventually. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the first volume is the first five issues, which is the first arc. That yes. is the end of Jamie S. Rich's writing on the story, and Joelle Jones will take over both writing and art in volume two. But cool. it's super good. Mm-hmm. And uh if you like assassins slash spy stuff, um it's cool. Awesome. The reason that I got into this series is Mannix was really excited about it and bought a print that is like, uh, it's they're like these fake 1950s ads. And it's like, guys, get her what she really wants, a cult. And it's like her holding a gun. Yeah. I was like, this is perfect. Kay. There's also a Frigidaire one where she's like stuffing a body into like a, like a freezer Frigidaire unit. Kit got a print for her kitchen and it's just like, Arsenic. He'll never complain that dinner is late again. <laughs> <laughs> They're really great. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. So tell tell me, what are you bringing this week? Uh, so I am bringing back Little Nemo: Return to Slumberland. Mm. This is a four issue limited series from IDW. It's written by Eric Shanauer and drawn with by Gabriel Rodriguez with colors by Nelson Daniel. Uh, this is not a reboot. This is not a reimagining. This is a continuation of the classic newspaper comic strip by Windsor McKay. Um, and if you don't know anything about Little Nemo, it was this uh, comic from, I think, like the teens and 20s uh, about this little boy who would go to sleep and go to Slumberland, where he was the playmate of the princess of Slumber- Slumberland, and they would have weird, surreal adventures in this mm-hmm. forever changing dreamscape. Uh, and this book basically picks up in the modern day. Uh, the King of Dreams and his daughter are still around because they're immortal dream creatures. And she needs a new playmate. So they find this new kid to try and bring him to Slumberland. And he's initially very reticent. And then kind of slowly over the the, the course of the issues kind of gets more into it. Uh, and they have kind of these weird, wild, very colorful and imaginative adventures in Slumberland. 
Uh, and it's just, it's a beautiful, beautiful mm-hmm. work to behold. It is so wonderfully illustrated. Uh, and I just, I really dig it and I'd love to talk about it. Yeah, it's really pretty. Um, Does it still make sense if you've never read the original comic? But yes, you, you, really, you really do not need to know anything from the original comic. Okay. They tell you everything you need to know at the very beginning. All right, because I've seen the movie from the 80s. And, and you probably the NES game. If you know you played more the NES than game, enough. Then you're perfect. The, okay. All you need to know is there is a place called Dreamland, okay. Slumberland. I mean, <laughs> whatever. It's a place you sleep and you go there. That's it. Yeah. That's all you need to know. But there's just like these astoundingly cool, like panorama landscape shots. Yeah. And Very like cool. weird, surreal, twisting landscapes. It's really cool. Beds with legs that walk. Yeah. Totally. It's cool stuff. Uh. Cade, what would you like to bring this week? Um, I am bringing part two of a book that we've already done. Dun, dun, dun. Um, one of my throwback pitches, um, and that is The Fuse, volume two. Ooh. Well, I want to read volume one, too, because if you don't read it... If you weren't on that episode. Yeah, or, well... Or if you forgot, like I did. Exactly. I, <laughs> I forgot most of what happens except the very ending, so I'm going to reread it. Um. But yeah, so volume two, the the first one was the Russia shift. Volume two starts out and uh, it's about street racing and on the, the uh, space station and the cops and they get involved. Yes. They start street racing too. <laughs> um, Do they knock over a fruit cart and, cl- and crash through a plate glass window? Those are all things that must happen in a yeah in every chase. chase in every police chase. I don't remember. I, I wasn't paying attention. All right, um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's important to go back and look at books that we've done and that because we always say like you know I wish there had been so many more issues to finish the story or I wonder where this character is going to go in the future. Well, here's our chance to see where the characters went in the future, but is now in the past. Wait, because it's out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm with you. I got you. Brant, what did, what did you bring? Well, I'm going to call an audible because some... Yeah, just because. So I'm going to bring back... Because you want to? Yeah, because I want to. So somebody reminded me last week of something that I want to talk about a lot, which is Chew by Layman and Gullison. Mm, I can't remember the artist's name. And I feel very badly about that now. But we talked about it last episode. It was a pitch. I say the first three trades, bam, 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 because it reads real fast. Um, that was a pitch by Kerbotron 2000. Yes, I believe it was. And I think Kaylee did one relatively recently. It's, yes. it's been pitched a lot. Yeah. yeah. So now is it's time to shine. But... Uh, Man eats things. Man learns things from things he eats. Hilarity ensues. What more is there to say? Cool. Chard, what do you got? Um, Kirby recommended that on the last she episode. Did. Um, That's what I meant. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, I am recommending a book that was originally a webcomic through Monkey Brain. It was a digital comic through yeah. Monkey Brain um, called High Crimes. It's by Chris Sabella and by, uh, with art by Everybody's Boyfriend, Ibrahim Mustafa. Um, he's, he's a handsome man. Just okay. go look at a picture of him. Um, and uh, a fantastic artist as well. Not just a pretty face. Um, so it's a book. They finally put out the hardcover, I guess. And Dark Horse is the impetus as to why I'm pitching this now. Are we doing a year of Dark Horse now? <clears throat> yeah, it's a whole year of Dark... No, I just <laughs> <laughs> this happened to be a Dark Horse book. Uh, and it's this beautiful hardcover that contains the full yeah, story. It and it's only 20 bucks for a hardcover for this. Oh. Beautiful, fantastic, full-color, excellent hardcover uh, with great art and excellent writing. 20 bucks. How could you pass that up? How is a Marvel four-issue trade fifteen ninety nine? How does oh, that happen? Yeah. Um, I'm for sure four issues. Seventeen ninety nine. Is it really now for oh, four God, issues? Yeah, it's at Ugh. least eighteen bucks. Ugh. It's ridiculous. Uh, and this was gross. Like eight or ten issues. Either. This is ten issues. This is a ten yeah. issue story. Um, and paper quality is not a good <clears throat> chart. Don't delude yourself. No, it's so thick. It's so thick and luscious. <laughs> Come feel this. <laughs> smell, smell this book. Um, chart. I'm not going to rub your. <laughs> rub this book. Um, but it's uh, so. 
Okay, there's a couple different characters, and and the plot happens out of a specific order. But I'll try to quickly like give you the gist. Um, so this woman, she was disgraced in the Olympics. Basically, she fell. She was a snowboarder. She fell. She took a tumble to avoid the press and everybody kind of like trying to talk to her. She ran away, ran around the world, ends up in Asia near Mount Everest. And what she does for a living is basically like illegally go up the mountain to find people who've died, uh, take their hands and like have them fingerprinted and identified for reasons. And uh, they find the, uh, the hand of a guy that went there to not be found. And the secret shady, possibly government organization that he worked for is like, Motherfucker, that's where he went? We, now we need to go get the body because he's got secrets on him and we need to go get it. So they like hijack this climbing team to take them up Everest and stuff happens and it's a good and then it's got flashbacks to like the guy who's dead, his like spy hit hitman uh government assassination story that he was on and why he kind of like left that organization and what happened. And it's this parallel narrative and Christabel's writing is absolutely fantastic and the art is super good and I like it. And it's Mount Everest. Cool. It's a cool place for a story. Everyone should read it. It's a cold place. It's a cold place. It's super cool out. Like very cool. Very cool. It's a cool yeah, you, you temperature. You should probably read this Pack a jacket. inside a refrigerator <laughs> to get the full on. Absolutely. In the same way that I would tell you to like do that for white out. Also do that for parts of this book. Should we get frostbite as part of the experience of reading this book? <laughs> yeah. Yes. yes. Get into the story, Brandon. Embrace you it. Take a couple of your fingers. <laughs> well, I Cut know what I'm voting off. for. Yeah. Um, so, Kaylee, what, what would you like to read this week? Uh, I am going to vote for Chew. Uh, I'm going to vote for High Crimes. Kate? Mountain climbing and crime fiction. High Crimes has got my vote. Brandt? Mm-hmm. Uh, Lady Killer sounds particularly delightful. It is delightful. Um, which means I'm voting for well, return. You, you can vote for whatever you I want. I can. For. Yeah, because we have a new voting system. We do have we that. Have we have yet to yeah. employ. We did it once. That's not true. Yeah, we did. We did, we did, we did, do, we did it do it one time. Uh, okay. but I want to. I want to read Return to Slumberland. Okay, then vote for that. Because I'm gonna vote for that. Okay, because it also means then we're reading High Crimes. There you go. Which I really want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, everyone should this. read Return to Slumberland because I personally do love that and I would like to talk about it at yeah, some point. Mm-hmm. My copy says that they were nominated for an Eisner and I seem to feel like they won after that. Why did they not wait to reprint it until after I, they won well, the Eisner? this is the copy that I bought and it has a sticker on it. Aren't oh, it's a sticker? Winners. I thought it was like a press they are in my heart. Exactly. <laughs> if it was nominated, that means it won. Unless we're talking about the Hugos. Those people can burn in hell. <laughs> well, Wait, what? Tune in next week when we Long talk about story. the Hugo Awards. We won't. Oh. So spoilers, we're a, not there was a scandal involving the Hugos this year with... You can look it up online. I yeah. know. John Scalzi has talked about it. All right. Good night, everybody. Yeah, we'll see you next thanks time for listening. For High Crimes. Bye. 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 Thank you for listening to me from the gutters. I hope our recommendations have inspired you to go out and find some new comics you'll enjoy. Join us next time for a discussion of our selected title. But like every week, we encourage you to read all of the recommended books. In the meantime, please leave us an iTunes review. It really does help new listeners find the show. You can also like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube, and follow us on Twitter at ViewFRTHGutters. Feel free to email us at contact at ViewFromTheGutters.com. Please send us any questions, comments, or recommendations you might have. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel as we post new videos every week. And thanks again for listening. And as always, keep reading.